mostly what golfers are hearing when they're standing over the ball is a lot of noise. I've worked with PGA professionals who have told me they are terrified, and this is the word they've used, terrified, standing over the ball. They don't know how to take the club away because they are too full of information. Shall I do it this way? Shall I do it that way? So with neuroscience and all the research that's been done over the past 30 odd years or more, they've proven what the Tai Chi masters have said. Stillness is the master of motion. So neuroscientists have shown that the athlete with the quietest mind is always the one that delivers the most fluid motion. So therefore, it makes sense to develop a performance practice so that you can quieten your mind. Golf Smarter, number 794. This week's episodes of Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans are brought to you by dynamicgolfers.com slash golf smarter. Get a seven day free trial and 15% off your membership with checkout code golf smarter. This episode is also brought to you by Caldera Lab, makers of The Good. According to GQ Magazine, The Good is the best natural face serum for men. Special offer for Golf Smarter listeners. Get 20% off your first purchase. Go to calderalab.com and use discount code GOLFSMARTER at checkout. And a quick note about today's interview, which features the return of Jane's story. This was recorded about two weeks ago, and due to Phil Mickelson's victory at the PGA Championship this weekend, I've moved it up our schedule due to the relevance of Lefty's comments on what contributed to his victory, which included yoga, diet, and meditation. Let's do this. The 10 Essential Keys to Mastering Pressure with author Jane Story. This is Golf Smarter sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Jane. Hello, Fred. Thanks for inviting me back again. It's really good to uh, be here with you. Well, it's nice to have you back because you've got a new book. Um, but before we get to the new book, The Practice of High Performance... Let's recap a little bit your last book that we talked about. We had you on last about Breathe Golf. That's How's right. How's that been going? Yeah, it's been going very well, actually. Um, I've got uh, quite a few reviews now on Amazon. And pretty much daily now, I, I get a message in my inbox from somebody around the world who has read the book. And mostly people have had instant success or um, playing a different kind of level in their golf, something more enjoyable and, and more free. But I do get questions from people about the practice of uh, formal meditation and how best to apply that. But uh, yeah, it's, um, it's definitely getting a worldwide following, slowly but surely. Well, as long as it's moving forward, just like in golf, as long as we're making forward progress, it's a good thing. Exactly. And I, you know, this is the part that um, I struggle. I do not do meditation. I have never been one to do it. And I, I know the value of it. I understand the value of it. I just, for any number of reasons why I don't do it. Um, but how it pertains to uh, golfers is what intrigues me. Well, you, you're almost in a catch-22 there, Fred, by not doing the practice. Um, although, of course, that's not a criticism because it probably is one of the hardest things in the world to sit down quietly on your own, no phone, no internet, no radio, nothing, and just sit and try to bring some attention to your breathing. Um, but if one doesn't do the practice, and unfortunately there are a lot of people putting out information about 
so-called mindfulness who don't do the practice. And they're offering something to their students and clients and listeners that isn't as true as it could be. Because as you said, we can all understand intellectually the benefits of doing formal meditation. We can understand it. But when we practice and sustain our practice over weeks, months and years, we understand something different, which is beyond the analytical mind. Does that, um, does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah, it's, it's hard enough. Um, there's a lot of conversation that I've been having in my life lately about the dependence, if I have to use that word, on the, not just the phone, but the internet itself. Just having access to information constantly to constantly being bombarded with that and how that is not just a distraction, but how it's become part of life itself. Um, and it, and it interrupts not only your own time, but your time with others. I think it's um, detrimental to human development and human potential. I think it's actually quite serious what, what you're saying. And in Breathe Golf, um, I cited some research which suggested that a human being can be present, so, you know, in the moment that they're in, for about 12 seconds. And now it seems that that window has narrowed to about eight seconds and mm. especially if you look at the younger generation i don't see anybody under the age of about 25 or 30 being able to walk down the street get a coffee work out in the gym without being glued to their phone so the attention span is getting shorter and shorter and shorter so therefore the thought of sitting <laughs> for 10 15 20 minutes honing the attention on the breathing and the sensation of the physical body which were the buddha's original teachings the original practices it's incomprehensible for most people which is mm -hmm. why the average person will say, well, yeah, I'm doing mindfulness, but I, I'm using this great app. And, <laughs> you know, we can have a, do a whole podcast on the difference between mindfulness, so-called, and formal meditation. But, I mean, it's, um, what you say is absolutely true, but I, I think it's, it's very, very serious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you don't want to put I, a honestly, camera on things. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so interesting because, I, I mean, part of, of, of doing Golf Smarter, I've learned how important breath control on slowing down breathing, that how that helps, especially when things aren't going great right on the golf course because we tend to everything speeds up, including our breath. But how important... Um, that is in a round of golf, in your golf swing. But if it wasn't, and I hate to say this to you, but if it wasn't for my watch reminding me a couple times a day to breathe, mm. I would never think it. I would never think of it. Yeah, but there's a, there is a, a deeper way and perhaps a better way to approach that where, I mean, the feedback from a lot of my students who have committed themselves to 20 minutes formal meditation practice a day they are learning to remember their breathing themselves without the use of the phone chiming in every 20 minutes or whatever and, and telling them to do so 
because mm -hmm. when you're and the value of that is enormous because when you're standing over the ball and your nervous system is going crazy there's the anxiety the adrenaline the all the mental interference if you've done your practice and you've trained yourself to come back to your breathing then you have a chance of overriding those eons of programming in the nervous system if you just go oh my phone's telling me to breathe but you you're not doing the practice or you're not making the effort it's almost like getting somebody else to do your push-ups for you you know rather than doing the workout <laughs> yourself in the gym it's very very subtle and of course as you said earlier a few minutes ago with the information age everybody wants everything now oh mindfulness i can buy that you know, oh, I can have that app on my phone. Oh, I listen to this YouTube series and yeah, I've got it. And so what I'm trying to bring is something that's much more formal, it's much more traditional. It's not for everybody, but um, the rewards of making the effort are phenomenal. Is it really possible to have somebody else do the push-ups for me well i mean that's what you're that's that's <laughs> that's what we're doing when we i was off. kidding <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> um it, 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 it's interesting how you talk about that that it's you know instant the information age everything being instant i remember once my son he was questioning why we subscribe to a physical newspaper. This was years ago because we don't anymore. But while we were subscribing to a physical newspaper, and I said, well, to get caught up on what's going on. And he goes, well, first of all, the newspaper is yesterday's news. Mm -hmm. And if it's that important, and if it's that important, it's going to find me. And I thought that was so profound that he didn't realize what he said. But the mm. news is going to find him if it's that important for him mm. to know. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, we're going to take a time out right, right now. And then when we come back, I want to start talking about your new book, The Practice of High Performance. Great. Thanks, Fred. This episode of Golf Smarter is brought to you by DynamicGolfers.com. This past weekend, we witnessed history as Phil Mickelson won the PGA Championship and became the oldest player in history by a couple of years to win a major. Of course, everyone from tour pros and weekend hackers were excited for Lefty's victory, but they also wanted to know how he did it. Phil has explained that there were three elements that contributed to his success, diet, meditation, and yoga. How lucky are we to have been talking about how a daily workout using dynamicgolfers.com can increase your mobility and flexibility. Now, they don't use the word yoga anywhere in their literature, but as someone who has dabbled in a yoga practice for most of my adult life, I'm more committed than ever to continuing my 15 to 20 minute morning practice utilizing dynamicgolfers.com. Not just because Phil has professed how much yoga has helped him, but because I'm getting results. Since using dynamicgolfers.com, not only do I feel better, am hitting the ball farther, and have eliminated some annoying body pains that have been bugging me for months. But also, my index has already dropped a full point into the 10.5 range. So I encourage you to check them out for yourself, to follow their daily video routines, and track your progress because you will start seeing results within four weeks. For only $9.99 a month, you can join golfers worldwide that make dynamic golfers part of their daily routine as well. There's even a custom landing page for my listeners at dynamicgolfers.com slash golfsmarter. Go there now to get a seven-day free trial and 15% off your membership when you check out using the coupon code GOLFSMARTER. So please check them out today and let me know what you think. But don't forget, 
To take advantage of their discount offer, use the checkout code GOLFSMARTER at dynamicgolfers.com slash golfsmarter. I thank them very much for their interest in the Golf Smarter community and supporting our mission to make every one of us happier, better, smarter golfers. So you've got a new book out now, Jane, called The Practice of High Performance. It's your second book, right? That's right. Well, it's actually my third book. I, I wrote a book on Tai Chi years and years ago, but uh, this is my second recent book. Excellent. And this is not just about for golfers, but it really does pertain to golfers. Oh, it certainly it's does. for a lot of athletes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about... As you say, it's called the practice of high performance. And what I'm trying to share is that there are principles of mind-body connection, principles of movement, which apply to any athlete because they apply to the performance or the release of complex movement in high-pressure situations whether that complex movement is the golf swing, the tennis serve, uh, the jump shot in basketball, your half pipe routine on your snowboard, whatever it is, it's the performance of complex movement. So many, many people, when they write about performing under pressure, I find that they approach it quite generally. And a lot of people have, who have had success in business and strategy and just general life success try to bring those same principles into the area of performing sports under pressure. And what I've really tried to hone in on over a 34-year uh, career is, well, what is it that the athlete is trying to perform under pressure? What is it? And it's movement. It's the complexity of movement, complex movement, which, as I'm sure your listeners will identify with, sometimes that complexity of movement is executed in the most fluid, free, and natural way. And we call that flow or we call it the zone. And that shows up mm -hmm. in all sports, but mostly it just happens, you know, almost like the perfect accident. Yes. Yeah. No question. Um, and, and one of the things that I want to do in this conversation is you have in the book, you have the 10 essential keys to mastering pressure. And I want to break each one of those down. I want to go through them one by one if we can. But before we do that, there was a line that you had. It was probably in the preface too, but it was a line that you had that just jumped off the page for me in the sense that of all the conversations that I've had with different instructors and I've learned so much over the years, you know, uh, Fred Shoemaker talks about awareness. They, it, they, Talk about the things that you need to um, do and the, the adjustments that you need to make when you're in a golf swing and whatnot. And the line that you had said, the mind can no more take over the role of the body and perform the functions of the physical body any more than the body can take over the functions of the mind. Right? Absolutely. It's, um, it's very difficult to accept and to understand, but we have no mind-body connection. We, we, we have either none or very, very little. Most of the time we're led through our lives by the mind. The mind on the golf course will have an idea about the golf swing. It has an idea about movement that it wants the body to perform in a few moments' time. And you're standing over the ball and thinking about your technique. That's very, very different to being 
having your mental attention somehow anchored in the body, which is what all your martial artists, all the Zen arts from calligraphy to sword swordsmanship, that's what the Eastern arts and the Eastern approach have always tried to do. If you can picture uh, or it just imagine a samurai warrior before they are in battle or an archer perhaps the the prerequisite thing for the in the eastern arts is to bring the mind and the body together you can't possibly mm -hmm. imagine a samurai thinking about technique, the technique of his throw, what is he going to do, put his weight on his right foot, turn through the centre, move his left shoulder up, but, you know, turn the right wrist at the, at the correct time. It's just not going to happen. That, that doesn't happen. The focus is mm -hmm. bring the mental attention to the breathing, to the hara centre, body centre of gravity, to the balance point on the feet, and then something extraordinary happens when the mind and the body are more united then movement itself becomes more connected the the body knows all about the kinetic chain and torque and leverage and ground force energy but we've sort of made a god of the mind and the information and the mind likes to think that it can control leverage, ground force, energy, rotation. Um, it's a very subtle distinction between, you know, what I'm trying to bring from my background and, and the mainstream way. But it's, you know, it, it's, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, and so often when things are not going well on a golf course, we try to make adjustments here and make adjustments there and think it through and think of all the way through the swing or, or stand over the ball and, and think about all the things that we have to do to, to have a successful golf shot. That's, and that's just creating more noise, right? It creates an incredible amount of noise and it, it, it takes you away from where you are. Mm -hmm. A lot of my students, you know, they'll they'll tell you. And if you if you read Breathe Golf or the Practice of High Performance, I've brought a lot of um, what my students have shared and case studies, if you like. And you know, time and again, it's proven that you know the athlete or the golfer with the quietest mind in the moments before they start moving is the one that would deliver the most fluid shot. And mm. we, I think we spoke before about Jack Nicholas, who was my um, inspiration. I mean, you're talking about 20 odd years ago when I first thought, oh, I'm going to try to bring Tai Chi principles into sport. But if you look at Nicholas and his generation of golfers, they would have been developing what I'd call a state of relaxed readiness over the ball. Like mm. the same as Miyamoto Masashi, the samurai swordsman. They didn't practice swing technique and positions and positions of the sword and katas and forms. And they didn't practice this as much as we do now. They practiced this state of being there over the ball or being there with the sword, this state of relaxed readiness that allows the body to respond to intention, which is very different from thinking through a menu of swing positions. You have to stop. Well, you just... I go on, I can go on and on about this for hours. <laughs> uh, well, we're not going to do hours, but we are going to come back and, and do some more. You just... You just uh, gave us a good tease about this uh, 10 essential keys to mastering pressure by giving us number four, which was relaxed readiness. But when we come back, we'll start with number one, which is controlling right. biochemistry right after this. As golfers, we spend a lot of time out in the sun, and it's a wonderful thing. 
But if you haven't noticed yet, your skin is getting dry and damaged because of it. That's why I wear a full-brimmed hat and sunscreen. But aging and the sun are still taking their toll. That's why I'm really happy to introduce you to a skincare product that is green tech, born in nature, perfected by science, and designed specifically for men. The Good by Caldera Lab. The Good is clinically proven to bring back healthier, younger-looking skin. Whether you're tackling dry skin, acne scars, wrinkles, or just want healthier skin, then I suggest you give The Good a try. Simply apply to dry, clean skin every night, and even though it's an oil, The Good doesn't cause breakouts because it doesn't go on greasy. Honestly, I'm amazed at how good it feels once I use it and how little I'm concerned about it staining or greasing up my pillow. Caldera Lab is committed to helping golfers look younger, so they're offering Golf Smarter listeners a 20% discount off your first purchase. Just go to Caldera Lab and use discount code GOLFSMARTER at checkout. If you don't love it, they will give you a full refund because it's 100% risk-free. That's The Good from CalderaLab.com. C-A-L-D-E-R-A-L-A-B. CalderaLab.com and get 20% off your first order with checkout code GOLFSMARTER. I'll put a link in today's show notes and on our blog post at GOLFSMARTER.com. I really uh, look forward to to breaking this down, and and we'll take a couple minutes with each, with each point. Um, but if you need more, just keep talking. I have no problem with that because I'm finding this so interesting. So the ten essential keys to mastering pressure. Number one, you have controlling biochemistry. Yeah, and I would say that this is probably the most important thing because it doesn't matter how much you know about golf swing technique. It doesn't matter how long you've been playing. It doesn't matter if you won your last tournament. If your biochemistry is going off the charts, you won't be able to swing or putt, um, you know, in the way that, in the way that you want to, your body's not going to perform properly. You're not going to move freely. So your biochemistry is a fight, flight, or freeze response that's kind of hardwired into the nervous system. And alongside that, there's the sort of the counter response, which is the relaxation response. And we are in one or the other, or somewhere between the two, depending on how we're breathing, which again is why the practice of focusing on the breath following the breathing in meditation is so useful. So when you're standing over the ball, if you find yourself either shallow breathing or as some people do, holding the breath, then it's creating anxiety in the nervous system. So because that anxiety, you start to feel anxious. Then the mind that wants coherence with that feeling starts to say, oh, well, you know, I I shanked the ball last time I was on this tee or I hid it in the water or, oh, my God, everybody's watching me from the clubhouse. You know, so the mind joins in with those feelings of anxiety. And the end result of all of that is your swing breaks down. And we've seen this. We see this even at the highest level in golf. So the Mm -hmm. the other part, the other side of that equation is If I'm nervous over the ball, and I see that, but I try to come out of my mind and into my body, the Hara center, center of gravity, start to breathe a bit more deeply, and all those things that you've practiced in your meditation sessions, then you change the biochemical response, which is the brain's Uh, linked to the nervous system you change it and you feel a bit more relaxed and when you're relaxed then the heart rate goes down the muscles are more pliable and you can swing with more freedom so that's that's your biochemistry and if that's not under control it, it it doesn't matter if you think you you know you're using positive thinking or 
technical information. It, it, it makes no difference. Wow, wonderful. Let's go to number two, which is quieting the mind. Kind of leads directly into it, right? Yeah. Um, well, the, the Tai Chi masters, I mean, you're talking about hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years ago, have always said that stillness is the master of motion. In fact, those two things, stillness and movement, are two sides of the same coin. But as you pointed out a few minutes ago, mostly what golfers are hearing when they're standing over the ball is a, is a lot of noise. With all the swing thoughts and all the technical stuff. And I mean, it goes to the point where I've worked with PGA professionals who have told me they are terrified. And this is the word they've used, terrified, standing over the ball. They don't know how to take the club away because they are too full of information. Shall I do it this way? Shall I do it that way? Which method shall I use? Blah, blah, blah. So with neuroscience and all the research that's been done over the past 30 odd years or more, they've proven what the Tai Chi masters have said. Stillness is the master of motion. So neuroscientists have shown that the athlete with the quietest mind is always the one that delivers the most fluid motion. So therefore, it makes sense to develop a performance practice so that you can quieten your mind. And again, this is, this is done partly with the practice of meditation, but also a lot of the other Eastern practices that I'm bringing into this uh, new book, the Practice of High Performance. You're definitely bringing a lot more Eastern practice into this book. I noticed that as well. <laughs> I'm on a mission. Um, and, I really am. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I did get that sense. I did get the sense that you were on a mission with I'm this on a one, mission. much more than brief golf. Yeah. And your mission, why don't you just state it outright? I was very shy and very introverted for most of my life. So I know what all those feelings of anxiety and self-interference, I know, I know that, I understand that. And having done my practice for 34 years, nothing gives me greater joy than to help somebody sort of break that cycle in sport. I love sport. I love all sport. I love to train my body. I love to run and swim and go to the gym. And having watched and seen and researched, you know, we can see a, a, a world-class or Olympic athlete one minute execute something like a dive maybe off a high board perfectly but then it comes to the last dive and all the judges are watching and everything's riding on this and they mess it up so it's like well, why why so my whole life has been to really crack that code and um that, that's my mission is to is to bring it to people who have the discipline to develop a performance practice. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> You're welcome. And thank you for making that a mission that we can share with you. <laughs> I, pre I appreciate that. I completely understand when you talk about even elite, elite athletes who are get stand over the ball and they're terrified. I know that the times when I'm playing uh, my, my best golf and it's reflected in my index, my handicap is the time I start questioning, what am I doing? How do I do this? And it, it completely gets in the way and changes the trajectory of how I play. Uh, it's, I struggle with it. it. It's true. And I'm writing a new book for you now, Fred, which is called Connected Golf. And uh, I hope that's going to be out in the autumn. I'm writing it as fast as I can although it's taken me about 10 years so far um, mm. but I'm talking in there about three levels of performance so at the highest level you have connected golf where the more your mind and body and breath are connected internally the more your movements connected and the level underneath mm. that I'm calling it good days bad days 
and everybody knows what that means. But the more you start thinking about technique, you end up in the bottom level, which is a completely different game called Search for a Swing. So you're no longer playing golf, you're, you're playing something com- completely different. And it's like, do you have Snakes and Ladders in America, the board game? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a bit like that. If you, if you follow the, the conventional approach of let's think about how we're thinking and let's think about how we're going to move in a few minutes, then you're in danger of coming down the down the uh, the snakes from the top level down to playing search for a swing. Whereas if you maintain your performance practice, even though you're nervous, even though the shot hasn't gone well, I spoke to two clients just just today, who yesterday and today, who've told me exactly this thing. They persisted with their performance practice, and rather than abandoning it and going into search for a swing, they stayed with the breathing, centre of gravity, awareness of being on the golf course, and by doing that, you lay the foundations for the mind and body to become in sync again, and then everything goes back to, you know, beautiful shots, and you can be creative, and you, you can move more freely. Mm-hmm. Uh, number three is holding the center. So this is um, a concept that's not used in biomechanics or sports science to the degree that it is in the martial arts. So the best way of explaining it is if you imagine a golf ball down in the lower abdomen, if you could sort of put it inside your belly button and just in front of the spine. So so you have a, a ball inside your lower tummy which acts as a fulcrum or a pivot point of motion. So if you think of an Aikido master or a Tai Chi master standing with very strong legs and then they, they move around this invisible center, throwing their opponents, you know, sending them flying, then this is the use of the Hara center or in Chinese martial arts, we would call that the Dan Tien. So we want to hold our attention to the center and hold the breathing to the center. And over time, we train to move from the center of gravity. And it is interesting that when I work with uh, golfers, especially, I mean, even with putting, I mean, you'd think this would just be on the big power shots, but even in putting, when I point out the center of gravity, people say, well, you know, it does feel on my on the best shots that I've been moving from there. So it's something that happens mm-hmm. quite naturally when we relax the upper body, let go of the tension in the shoulders, start to breathe more deeply, get a bit more connected to the ground, and suddenly we start moving from that horror center. But it is something, obviously, that, that we can train. Mm-hmm. Oh, especially in putting. All right, let's take another time out and then we'll come back. Uh, we've already done number four, relaxed readiness, but we'll come back to number five, listening right after this. As we go down the list of the 10 essential keys of mastering pressure, to mastering pressure, um, we, we get to number five and it's an interesting one for golf. And that is listening. Please explain that. Well, these are all um, concepts from the martial arts. And Mm -hmm. it's about paying attention to what your body is telling you. Which, again, is, is an awareness that's developed by doing your performance practices. If your grip's too tight... Do you notice that the grip's too tight when you're stepping onto the green? A lot of people don't. But listening for the feedback that your body's giving you, that you know, you're not ready to take the shot. You're anxious or you're thinking too much or there's too much tension in the upper body. 
So we de we develop listening in in the martial arts. So if any of your listeners have done um, Wing Chun, for instance, there's um, a two person exercise in there called Chi Sao, or in Tai Chi we have something called pushing hands, where you're touching arm to arm, forearm to forearm with your opponent. And they're trying to push you back. You're trying to uh, neutralize their force turn from the horror of the center of gravity and push forward and again they're neutralizing the force and pushing back towards you so it's a training system that helps you to really listen to what the body is doing um, so it's it's invaluable for for golfers because i mean for all sports but especially in golf because you have such a fine margin of error that when you're next over the ball, just see if you can, you know, really, really hear what, what is your body trying to tell you? Are you in the stress response or are you relaxed? Can you feel your feet or are you holding your breath? Are you even on the golf course or are you stuck in your mind? You know, so, so listening is, is, is crucial. It yeah, it's more of a metaphorical listening. It's it's really paying attention. I think you're right. Yes, yeah, right. It is paying attention to what's going on and and metaphorically hearing what your body's telling you. Yeah, it's right? listening for the biofeedback that you, that your body's giving mm -hmm. you. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, and and which, responding accordingly. Right, which leads perfectly into number six, which is self observation. Well, this is an ancient ancient practice. Um, Although a lot of things, you know, have been sort of dumbed down and and simplified in the modern age, but just trying to to be aware of yourself and really seeing is so valuable. I mean, I was chatting to a, an American PGA pro the other day, and uh, he's a is is an older gentleman. And he said he was out on the course with two like young bucks and they were super strong young guys and he felt a little bit intimidated and he realized that when he was walking up to the tee on the last hole that he was nervous. But I've been working with him and he's been applying these um, principles and he said that just by virtue of the fact that he saw it it changed everything. So we don't want to try to control anything. We just see, oh, I'm nervous. And then for him, quite spontaneously, it sparked a, uh, an inner reflection and a questioning on, well, why am I nervous? You know, golf is my life. This is what I live for. I love, I love this game. And these guys are my friends. So what? You know? And... Because he saw and acknowledged that he was nervous, it changed everything for him. Whereas, you know, mental game coaching would say, well, you know, you've got to like think positively and tough it out and all this stuff. Or you'd say, well, I need to work on my technique and maybe if I do this and do that, it's going to be okay. But this lovely, the simplicity of it is, you know, is what, what really helped him. Hmm. Fabulous story. Thank you. Great story. Um, it, I need I need some help. I want to uh, I want you to explain number seven, which is making time. Well, you have to allow a space or a pause for flow to manifest itself. I mean, let's take the masters recently. And I don't want to name any, any names, but there's a lot of guys not, um, not the winner, the Japanese. I'm thinking of Musashi, Miyamoto Musashi, but it, Matsuyama. Not Matsuyama, who I felt really took his time, and he really seemed to settle into his body over the shots. Mm. He settled into his body. And I would I would hazard a guess that he knows about the Hara Center and breathing and meditation because it's part of Japanese culture. But a lot of the other guys, especially some of them who were in contention 
um, and had a chance, they were rushing, rush, 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 rush. And so there's no time for the mind and body to connect standing over the shot. You could see that some of the other players were, it's all mental, it's all technique, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and whack. Matsuyama was settled, just settle, take a moment. So you have to allow, I'm not su suggesting that you stand there for five minutes, but if again, I sound like a broken record, I really I apologise, but if you do your <laughs> performance practice, let's say you've developed a discipline where you can sit quietly for 15 minutes a day, if you can do that, then you can get to the same place within a few seconds over the ball, let's say maybe 10 seconds, relax, empty the shoulders, empty the chest, find the horror with your breath and your attention, come into the balance point on the feet, and therefore you've primed your body, you've primed the my-body connection, and the shot's going to flow beautifully. So that's what I mean by making time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I, I, um, not to be distracted by it, but I can't imagine that anybody born after 1990 understands the idiomatic expression, sounds like a broken record. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Think about it. What oh, is, hey, what's a broken record? Enough. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I know some of my young uh, students say, call me a bit retro, you know, and make them write with pen yeah. and paper and not writing on their smartphones, but it's all good. <laughs> oh, Fred. What is a broken record? Sound like? What does that mean? But, you know, there's it's... another case, another case in point that I bought myself a turntable, professional turntable recently. and Oh, and, finals. Yeah. Getting big. I play a whole side of the record, sit and sit there for 20 minutes, listen to the whole side of the record, turn it over put the needle on, listen to the other side. And my neighbor, yeah. uh, in fact, this, this um, an anecdote is in the new book. She said, oh, I bought and one of those smart speakers, you know, where you can just say play, you know, Pearl Jam or Duke Ellington or whatever. And she said, you can play with anything. And um, I said, do you listen to a song all the way through? She said, no, no, never. So, wow. This is wow. how life's going. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that we used to listen in twenty-minute segments to to the one side of a an, an album or an LP or a thirty-three, and <laughs> and and with some records we never even flipped them over. It's like it's like I don't know that song. Well, it's because it's on the other side of the record. You, of course, you've never heard it. Before. Yeah, <laughs> I love my records. I love it. And Duke Ellington. If uh, you don't know who he is, just go and look him up. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, if you don't know who he is, then you haven't been experiencing Stevie Wonder because exactly, exactly. It, yeah. Oh no, Duke is. I love the, the Duke. Best. Yeah. Uh yeah, yeah. Me too. All right, let's take one more break, and then we'll come back and finish up with the last three points sure. of uh, of of the ten essential keys to mastering pressure, and we'll be right back. Hey, before I tease you with a taste of what's on Golf Smarter Mulligans this week, I wanted to share an email that I received about last week's conversation with Jennifer Monroe on the four different golf personality types. And it comes from Eric, who writes to me and says, Hey, Fred, Jennifer always nails the human side of golf, and I've recently seen her theories play out before my eyes. My usual foursome crumbled like a bad marriage a month ago, and the profiles you went through were on full display. Michael, and he puts it in quotes because I don't think he wants to share their names, Michael plays every shot like he's shooting for the green jacket, while Jim is zooming out in front of us in a mad rush to play as fast as possible, which slowed Michael down even more. Then Jim demanded we place some wagers to get him interested again or he's going to leave. Shouting ensued and we broke up into twosomes. Irwin and I now feel like unwanted children in a nasty divorce. 
It seems funny on the surface, but it has made it so much more difficult to fill out the foursome while allowing visitation rights to these pissed-off former friends. Oh, so good. Thank you, Eric, for sharing that with me. And again, that's something you can learn from even the old episodes of Golf Smarter. And on Golf Smarter Mulligans this week, we talked to Scott Gummer, author of Homer Kelly's Golfing Machine, The Curious Quest That Saved Golf. Now, apparently Bryson DeChambeau, who's been pretty controversial on the PGA Tour these days, and he's considered the mad scientist of golf today, he's a big fan of Homer Kelly. Well, in the book, Scott looks into uh, Homer Kelly's frustration with the game and, like us, his quest to play better. It's the story of golf's most curious genius uh, and really uh, an untold story about an underappreciated person who really changed the game. The story goes that Homer Kelly was the science-minded guy, but the only job he could get during the Depression was as a fry cook at a billiard hall in Tacoma, Washington. And his boss was a golf nut, kept haranguing Homer to come out and play. And Homer would needle him back and say, you know, what's the point? What's the fun? And eventually the guy got him to come out and play. Homer went out his first time and shot 116. But he was very perplexed. He didn't understand how it could be so hard. The ball's just sitting there on a tee. It's only going to do what you tell it to do. It really, it really was, a, was a very vexing proposition for him. And he didn't play again for six months. And when he did, he shot a 77. That's Scott Gummer this week on episode 110 of Golf Smarter Mulligans being released this Friday. Both Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Please follow both so that you can get a brand new episode of either when it downloads to your favorite listening device. Uh, I'm, I'm just loving this list and I'm so glad we're breaking it down. Uh, but the last three here, um, number eight is just enough. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that you don't have to try too hard and that, that, that you're trying should be towards making the right effort, which we've talked about quite a lot already. <clears throat> but if I, if you, if you try to force movement, especially with the mind, you end up with something that, you know, feels weird or feels unnatural or like forcing the ball down the fairway. But if you back off a little and even do something very simple like look around you on the golf course, you know, feel the breeze on your skin, hear the birds, things that people, mm -hmm. when they're in a state of anxiety and they're trying too hard and thinking too much and these poor guys who are terrified over the ball, you know, they, they stop being aware of all of that. So, oh, yeah, yeah, it's you know, you need to do just enough and trust the wisdom of the body mind, trust it rather than trying to dominate and control everything. Um, thinking about technique, you know, your job, if you want to take this line of developing a performance practice and then applying it in real-time pressure situations. Your job is only to try to establish a connection between the mind and the body. That's your job. And then when the mind and the body are more joined up, movement flows. I'm not suggesting that you abandon your swing coaching, not at all. I'm not dismissing mental game coaching, not at all. But I'm saying that when you're playing golf, when you're actually out there, then those two things, technique and mental game, mind and body, they need to be brought together. And the way to do that is with your performance practices. Otherwise, you're back in that realm of trying too hard. Mm-hmm. 
it, it's, it always amuses me when it's clear that someone has forgotten um, that they're outdoors in nature, trees and animals and clouds and sky and, you know, gorgeous, you know, controlled setting. And their focus is this 12 inch square around a little white ball. Exactly. And there's so much more. Exactly. And there's so much wisdom from the martial arts. For instance, if you if you get the book, you'll learn a standing meditation, which is integral to all the martial arts. And when you stand in particular poses and postures and focus on the breathing and the and the physical body, you're encouraged to look into the distance, into the horizon. And what we know about that now from neuroscience is when I look to the to the horizon, especially if I open my peripheral vision, it activates the occipital lobe at the back of the brain, which is the same place that produces the alpha waves that are um, um, that they come into uh, being. They're activated when you practice meditation. <laughs> It's quite extraordinary. So, yes, there's just so much. There's so much wisdom in 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 these Eastern practices. So much. Mm -hmm. Which kind of leads uh, it does, doesn't it? Whole radio turn. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a perfect perfect segue into <laughs> number perfect. nine, which is wonder and awe. Well, I was chatting to one of my students today, um, a, a, a guy in Sweden. And he was saying to me about a game that he played recently. And he said it was all going beautifully. It was perfect. The swing was lovely. The day was gorgeous. He was happy to be back out there again. And he thought, well, maybe today's the day that I'm going to break the course record. Maybe it's, everything's going to just come together. And he told me that as soon as he felt that or, or said that to himself, and I knew what was coming next, it, that the bubble burst. Oh, and absolutely. Yeah, it, it just burst, you know. So he was in flow, and then he was like, oh, my God, this is it. I'm going to win the cup or whatever, and the bubble burst. Oh, and yeah. he said he couldn't quite get back there, but he did enjoy the rest of the game. And he kept trying, and, and he kept because he's practiced with me for about three years now, he didn't abandon it and go into the other game, search for a swing. He stayed with it and stayed with it and stayed with it. And eventually he said on the 18th, it all came together again and he finished off uh, the game nicely and, and he was proud of his uh, performance. But he said to me, well, why is it, why does it just disappear like that? And yeah. the answer is, well, nobody knows. And I'm very lucky. I'm, I'm very lucky to have a teacher who's practiced for twice as long as I have. So you're talking about somebody who's de devoted their life to formal meditation for over sixty years. And you know, she's said many times that it, it's quite mysterious. It's a mysterious force that that flows through the athlete when the mind and body are more connected. And I think this we know this is true because when we see beautiful shots, whether it's golf or the perfect backhand in tennis or some of these incredible moves that they're doing now in figure skating, unbelievable moves. When the athlete tries too hard, it doesn't work. When they relax, but they're in the moment, this interesting state of the meditative state or flow when the athlete's there then movement itself is absolutely sublime sublime mm -hmm. and we see that in dance we see that in flamenco and they have a word for it they call it duende which is a slightly dangerous but ecstatic um freedom of movement and it's like the breath is given to us, movement flows through us, 
when we are more joined up and more connected inside. So, yeah, we... Anybody who's ever experienced flow and, and or the zone and spoken about it sincerely has said that it well it, it's otherworldly. It's you know it's something else. We don't really know what it is. The worst thing that any golfer can do to think about, and it, it's only compounds it if you verbalize it, <laughs> is to say something like. Oh, all I need is to par these last two exactly. holes and I'll have, right? And it's like kiss of death right there. Exactly. Looking at the scorecard, talking about what you need to accomplish. That's right. Uh, I'm guilty of it. I am very guilty of it. It happened to me just the other day. And I just, I, I know, why am I doing this to myself? Stop doing that. Uh, it, yeah. So frustrating. But didn't it even happen to Arnold Palmer once where he was going up? Oh, the, I'm sure. Yeah, to the 18th. I don't know what tournament it was, but somebody sort of broke ranks from the gallery and came out and shook his hand and said, you know, well done, well done, Arnold. And, of course, he, you know, he fluffed the last shot. Um, mm. But, yeah, it's because um, we always go back into thinking we can do it. We can, we're doing it. Right. We're not. It's like, um, <laughs> no, we're not. we're not, we're not. If you read um, Zen and the Art of Archery, um, mm -hmm. there's a wonderful quote in there where the Zen master, the archery master says to the, you know, Western student, um, you have too much willful will. You think that what you do not do does not get done. <laughs> this is just brilliant. Mm. Um, Subtle, mm. yeah. but, but brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's let's wrap up this list with uh, number ten, which is downtime and recuperation. Yeah, sometimes you just have to let it be. You right. know, you, your your practice can become routine, can become habit. And um, I had students who taken to this, like they said, right, I'm going to do 30 minutes twice a day, every day for 100 days. And it ends up not being as productive for them as it could be because they're going into trying too hard again. You know, so even Buddhist monks at the temples, they take, you know, three days off a month um, from their practice. So, you know, excuse my French, but you don't want to be a hard ass about it. You just you do your practice, and if one day you're feeling poorly, or you've had to um, get up early and go somewhere, or you don't have the time, you mustn't force it and try to fit it in at all costs. Um, but knowing the difference between, you know, sincerely needing to take a, a rest for a day or a few days and just wimping out on your practice you, you do need to know the difference yeah well jane i you know the book again is called the practice of high performance by jane story j-a-y-n-e-s-t-o-r-e-y and i i really appreciate you allowing me to pull out a, a major, major section of the book and just talk about it with you. Thank you so much for doing that. Can you let us know where we can find the book? Yes. Um, well, I'm just grateful to you, Fred, for interviewing me and allowing me to speak about my life's work. Um, and I'd love to offer a 50% discount on the book to any of your listeners who would like to go wow. to, yeah, to my website. And um, the book's available there on the home page of the website, and it's Qi, C-H-I, which is the Chinese word for the breath, C-H-I hyphen or dash performance.com. But I'm sure that um, you're going to put a link up uh, uh, with the write-up for the podcast, so people Absolutely. will be able to follow that. And um, and um, we'll put the code there, a, coupon code, and, and yeah. we can get it for half price. If we decide to do that another way, then we'll just uh, let you have my email address and I'll give it to you privately. But if you tell me you've um, contacted me after 
listening to um, my conversation with Fred on Golf Smarter, and I promise you that I'll let you have fifty percent off the off the new book. So, well, that's incredibly generous of you. Thank you uh, to get fifty percent off this book uh, only on Jane's website at chi chi dash performance dot com. Jane, great talking to you again. I look forward to hearing from you when the next book, Connected Golf, comes out. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation again, and uh, I hope it's been of value to your listeners. Thank you very much. So after I finished the conversation recording, Jane wrote to me to confirm that Golf Smarter listeners can get 50% off the price of the new book, The Practice of High Performance. Either include Chi50, C-H-I-5-0, on your order at chi-performance.com, C-H-I-performance.com, or write directly to Jane at Jane, J-A-Y-N-E, Jane at chi-performance.com. Very kind, very generous. And I'll leave that information in today's show notes and on our blog post at golfsmarter.com. Um, you know, it's quite compelling, especially after Phil Mickelson testified to his use of transcendental meditation that helped him win a major. So if you watched as he walked through the huge crowd on that 72nd hole as he's approaching the green on the final hole of the tournament, it was pure mayhem, but there was a peacefulness about him that was otherworldly. It was outrageous. But boy, I guess it works. Now, I'd like to make you an offer that I hope you won't refuse. Golf Smarter 800, weeks away. We've talked about this. And we're going to focus on what we've learned from these interviews. I'm going to be interviewed by our friend and TV personality, Maddie Blake, Maddie B, about what I've learned. But I want to hear from you, too. Maybe you have a question for me that you've been curious to know. Or better yet, I'd love for you to share your greatest takeaway from Golf Smarter. To do that, just call our Golf Smarter hotline at 415-761-1498 and leave your best take on that. But here's the offer. If we use your message on episode 800, you will receive Tony Manzoni's Lost Fundamental video for free. That's right. Tony's incredibly popular video, The Lost Fundamental, which can only be found through Golf Smarter, will be your prize if we use your question or comment on episode 800. Deadline to submit your call is the close of the 2021 U.S. Open, Sunday, June 20th. Again, the toll-free number to call, 415-761-1498. I'll continue to remind you as we get closer, but start thinking about it now. And when you're ready, call 415-761-1498. I'll leave that number in our show notes and a link at golfsmarter.com. Follow at Golf Smarter in social media, especially on Instagram, and follow Golf Smarter TV on YouTube. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions on what you'd like to hear on an upcoming interview, please write to me. Just click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com.